Hello, my name is Leslie Levy and I am the director of the International Quilt Museum in Lincoln, Nebraska at the University of Nebraska. And we are joined today to celebrate and to open or have a virtual opening of the exhibition for the love of Gaia. The International Quilt Museum boasts the world's largest quilt collection. We have almost 7,000 pieces now, which represent about 66 countries around the world and over 500 years of quilt making history, ingenuity, and artistry. One of our missions is to create um, a world-renowned collection and audience that celebrate the cultural significance of arts, and of quilts, and art histories. Annually, we present approximately 20 exhibitions in our seven gallery spaces. And we pride ourselves on offering exhibitions that are an interesting mix of international, traditional, contemporary, and studio art quilts. So being a part of a university, it's very important to us that we provide and curate exhibitions that raise social issues. And the exhibition for the love of Gaia is one such exhibition that we're offering this year. And um, it couldn't be more timely um, than this time <laughs> in our world. So, um, to begin with, we're so glad that everyone is here. We have the amazing artists um, that created the quilts that are in this exhibition, as well as our guest curator, Luana Rubin. And so before we dive into talking with our artists and our guest curator, we'd like to take three minutes and show you a virtual tour of the exhibition <laughs> so that not only do our artists, but the guests who've joined us have the opportunity to see what we're talking about. So um, let's, let's take a virtual tour. <laughs>
that gives you a little flavor for what the exhibition looks like. And we will be opening the museum um, on August 4th. Um, and when the museum opens, this exhibition will be um, up and available for people to see. So um, what's exciting is each piece is absolutely beautiful. And I'm so pleased that each of you are with us today and that we can share your, not only your artistry, but your quilts. And the person who has brought us all together is our wonderful guest curator, Luana Rubin. So it's my pleasure to introduce Luana. She is the president and co-owner of eQuilter.com, an online fabric retailer in Boulder, Colorado. 2% of all of eQuilter's sales go to charities focused on the environment and human rights. And they've raised $1.7 million for charity over the last 20 years. Luana has worked as a designer in the textile, garment, and quilt industries since 1980, and she is a chairholder for the International Trend Forecasting Organization, the Color Marketing Group. So it's no surprise with a history and with expertise like that, that she has put together this, A, amazing exhibition, but also such a world-renowned group of artists. So Luana, welcome. Thank you. Well, we would all be together tonight, perhaps toasting champagne and <laughs> enjoying this moment together. Uh, maybe not all of you could be here, all of you artists, so I'm absolutely thrilled that, that we can be all together from all over the world in this way. We have artists from the UK and from Australia. Uh, we do not have the Japanese artist online with us, but it's certainly an international exhibit. Uh, full of people who have international point of view. So in addition to thanking Leslie and uh, the staff at IQM, I wanted to thank all of you artists for coming to this exhibit in so many different ways. Some of you I invited because I knew that you were activists and you felt very passionate. Some of you came to this exhibit because I had seen your work and I it had been kind of circulating in the back of my mind for sometimes years. And when this came together, I said, boy, that piece has got to be in this exhibit. So as you know, I'm very passionate about this topic and this topic is not going away. It's only going to get worse. And I truly believe that at this time, we all need to become activists. And often artists are able to say things that, other, that we wouldn't be able to say with words otherwise. We can touch people's hearts and we can kind of move them off of the spot that they were on or get them to think about joining us and taking a more active role in saving the planet when we share something from our heart to theirs. And I have to admit, as I saw that video of the exhibit, I got a little verklempt. I, I don't know if you guys feel <laughs> the same way, but uh, I do hope that when this opens up in person that so many people can come to see the exhibit. And of course, we are working on other international venues, which we hope will come to pass. But right now, everything is a big question mark. But I, I so appreciate all of you. I mean, really from my heart, thank you so much for participating. And thank you to our viewers who share this with others. And hopefully this mm -hmm. will touch your heart and you will leave this experience uh, feeling like you're ready. You can give yourself permission to speak out for Mother Earth. Thank you, Luana. Like many of the webinars that we have attended um, or Zoom calls, so many since March for all of us, um, we're becoming old hat at this. Um, don't forget that there is the Q&A chat function at the bottom of your screen. So if people have questions or comments that they want to make, we will have a Q&A time at the end after we have visited with each of the artists. At this time, um, I would like to welcome our first artist, um, Betty Busby continued her childhood obsession with craft by earning a degree in ceramics from the Rhode Island School of Design. She founded and operated a successful ceramic tile manufacturing firm in Los Angeles, which she sold in 1994. She then moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico and changed her focus to fiber and mixed media arts for which we are all so incredibly glad <laughs> and appreciative of that. Um, she, Betty is a published fiber artist and teacher and maintains a busy exhibition schedule, both nationally and internationally. 
Betty, thank you so much for being with us. And thank you for starting. Um, we're going to let you talk to us about your beautiful piece. Well, thank you. Uh, fiber is certainly uh, a lot lighter and less dusty than clay. So <laughs> it's, my, knees, my knees are happy with my new career. But also thank you, Leslie, and thank you, Luana, for conceiving and hosting this exhibit and including all of us. It is very spectacular. And I do hope it will move and change people and move them towards taking care of our world. Uh, this piece is based on a photo of a Namibian desert that I saw years ago. And what really uh, brought, the photo really brought to mind that there was a forest here and now it's a desert. Mm -hmm. Because the encroaching sand dunes and the encroaching drought killed the trees and all that was left were skeletons of trees. So I uh, made this piece kind of thinking about that photo uh, and you know what the world could look like if the current trends continue. And coming from California, I'm very familiar with wildfires. So that whole fire in the distance look is something that we dreaded all the time uh, when I lived in uh, California. So uh, that was the genesis of this piece. And later on, if you have any questions, uh, you can just shoot me a text. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Our next artist is Carol Breyer Fallett Gentry. She is an award-winning fine art quilter whose work has appeared in numerous national and international exhibitions, collections, and publications. Carol's honors include inclusion in the 100 best quilts of the 20th century and selection to the 30 most influential quilt makers in the world. Carol has lectured and taught in 11 countries around the world. Carol, welcome. Well, thank you, and, and I'm really honored and thank Luana for inviting me to be part of this exhibition. One of the things that's in the news environmentally the most where I live in the Pacific Northwest overlooking Puget Sound uh, is the plight of the orca whales. Uh -huh. um, we, have, we have a local pod that live in Puget Sound and unlike the orcas that swim out in the ocean um, who eat mammals, our orcas only eat salmon and mostly just Chinook salmon. Um, and their numbers have dwindled to the point where the scientists really question whether um, there's any possibility of long-term survival for them. So, and there are a plethora of reasons for this, most of which I've included in my quilt. Um, in the border, I've written sort of all of the, the various reasons um, that the scientists think the orcas are disappearing and, and connected with that, the disappearance of the salmon because um, the orcas that have died recently are usually emaciated. They're just not getting enough food, but they're also not um, giving birth to live babies. And a lot of that has to do with chemicals that have been in the environment for many years. These animals live 60 to 100 years. And so the PCPs, for instance, that were outlawed in 1979 are still in their body and in their fat and the mothers pass it on to the babies. And so um, the few babies that have been born have not been viable. So it's a sad story. Um, uh, one of the reasons the salmon are dying out for a number of other reasons is that the rivers are dammed and so their spawning grounds have, have been blocked off to them. The one little piece of good news is that break in the border up there uh, the border is made of repeating photographs of one of the dams on the Snake River that prevents the salmon from going up to the spawning ground. Um, but the break in the border is a picture of a salmon happily swimming in the Elwha River 
where the dams were blown up and the environment is returning to what it should be. So it's a, it's a long story, so I'll ask questions at the end <laughs> or answer questions at the end. I think well, that's, that's it. terrific. Thank you. I, I, you know, I'm so glad that we have the artists to be able to explain to us some of the fun little details that then draw our eyes to those various parts and aspects of their work. So thank you. Our next artist is Cass Holmes. She lives in Maidstone, Kent, the United Kingdom, and tutors at the West Dean College. She combines reclaimed fabric and paper and found the materials in her layered and stitched art. She has studied in Japan and India and exhibits her work internationally. Cass is an author and most recent, uh, was most recently in textile landscapes. Cass? Hello from Britain. Um, this piece, um, I will talk in context of where I'm sitting. Behind this window, which is now coming down with the deep of night, finally in midsummer, are the Kent Downs. This is where I live. And um, the southeast of England is very um, heavily populated. And the Downs um, exist as, um, we, we li I live in a bowl, if you like, of landscape. So the Downs exist all the way around the horizon. But it's an area that has many motorways being built. The land is being taken, taken up. And I can see that ribbon from London gradually reaching out to Maidstone. Um, it's a, an area of outstanding beauty. It has chalk escarpments, wildflowers. And when I'm creating my work, I collect the materials from the locality where possible. So most of the materials are old shirts, um, pieces of paper I've picked up from the roadside. And these are then woven together into the structures that I make. It's a reminder that really when we're looking at the environment, we need to start on our own doorsteps, not just looking at the, in order to impact on the global environment. And I will have to say this week when people say what you think we're doing better here, you only have to look at our beaches where people have been going now they're out of lockdown to see how much rubbish is being strewn on the, uh, on the beach. I'm, I am deeply shocked and embarrassed by what we're doing here at the moment. Um, you know, I thought we had a bit of respite for the planet. I think this is nature's way of saying, you humans, you need to slow down, you're doing too much. And as me immediately we get out of lockdown, people are going back to what they're doing. All I'm going to say is, this is my hope for not a new normal. There should never be a new normal. This is my hope for a new different. We need to wake up and we have to wake up now because it won't just be COVID, there'll be lots of other things that we're needing to handle. It's not, we inhabit this our planet equally. That's all I'm going to say. Well, it was very well said, and I think all of us would agree that you are absolutely correct. Our next artist is Hollis Chatelaine. She lives in Hillsboro, North Carolina, and is an internationally recognized and award-winning artist specializing in textile painting. She has an educational background in design and photography, 12 years of experience working with humanitarian organizations in West Africa, and over 35 years of experience as a professional artist. Her work addresses challenging social and environmental themes. Welcome, Hollis. Thank you. Um, well, I would like to start out to say that I was really excited to be asked to participate in this exhibition. And so I thank Luana and I thank you also, Leslie, for putting this together because I think it's just a, an incredibly important topic. And we, art is such a wonderful way to bring awareness to these topics. And so I'm just, I'm very excited to be involved in it. And with this piece, it started because I just love plants and I, I have a big garden, I have lots of flowers, we have a big vegetable garden. And from the time that I was even a teenager, I had 75 plants in my bedroom. So I, 
I really like plants. That's all there is to it. And I love corals. And I've never had the opportunity to to actually scuba dive, that's on my bucket list. But I love looking at the pictures of them. I love the colors and the textures and all of that. And so I wanted to combine the, my favorite types of plants and animals like this, this type of thing together in a piece that, that was jarring. I was searching for something that was jarring. And so I made the edges of it beautiful colors like they would be if it were in the ocean. And the center is like the, the, the plants were bleached. It was like they were going away. And I have pitcher plants and, and agave plants in my garden and I just love them. And so I was able to photograph them myself and make them into the piece. And then the coral, I kind of made it up and I tried to imagine the colors that it would be, make it even more bright and more beautiful. And <clears throat> we're destroying our plants and our animals. It's because of us. And I think that that's something that, that we have to face. You know, it's very easy to say it's global warming, but we need to say we're doing it. It's humans who are doing it. And, and that's why I I didn't want to go back to what it used to be. I wanted to talk about, visually talk about what it is right now. And that's why I made the center bleached and the edges in, in the bright colors of what it used to be. But the majority of the piece is what we're looking forward to in our future. Right, unless we make a change. Unless we make a change. Yeah. And yeah. that has to come from not a small minority. That wow. has come from all of us. We all need to do it. Right. So thank you again for, for giving us this opportunity to, to talk about this through visual means. You bet. Well, it, it, it's way, we're way past due on it, aren't we? Yes, we are. Our next artist is Gaia Grotto. Gaia Grotto's piece is Mother Earth and is this beautiful Madonna, which is in Luana's collection. And um, if you don't mind, the maker was born in Russia and currently lives in France. But I'm going to let Luana talk a little bit about it since it is her piece now. Yes, and I'll speak for Gaia. Yeah. I saw this piece for the first time when I went to the Canadian Quilt Festival a few years ago. I was able to get in at, at the beginning of the exhibit because I was a sponsor to take photos. And as I walked around, I saw this piece from across the room and I walked up to it and I was just so struck by it. And I walked away and looked at the rest of the exhibit and came back to it and I just thought, I have to have this piece. So I purchased the piece while I was there and it came to me later. And I guess other people felt the same way because it's been featured in four different magazines and all over the internet since I purchased this piece. When I met the artist the day after I had purchased it, she arrived the day after the award ceremony. Uh, she had a friend who had invited her, had told her, hey, you should enter your piece here in, in the Canadian show. So Gaia lived in Russia, then she went to Ukraine, then when the Civil War happened, she moved to France, and then she ended up showing this in Canada. And I told her about e uh charity program and the different organizations, the environmental nonprofits that we support in our human rights work. And as I told her, tears welled up in her eyes and she said, oh my gosh, you're the perfect person for this piece. I, I can't believe that we've met each other in this way. And so I don't get to see Gaia too often, but uh, we do keep in touch by email. And I'm um, sorry she couldn't join us today, but. She is an incredible artist. I invite you to look up her work online. Uh, she makes these very evocative portraits and, and other topics as well. And I'm very lucky to have this piece. It has been hanging in my office. I've been looking at the Madonna and she's been inspiring me for a while now. But now I'm very happy to be able to share her with, with all of you. Well, we, uh, we, we thank you very much because it is a beautiful piece and um, love her eyes. Our next 
artist is who is with us is Ihor Gwadin. He lives in Ontario, Canada and began quilt making classes a few years ago. Already a wood crafter who built his own home influenced by the fantasy world created by J.R.R. Tolkien, he soon departed from the straight grid of quilts and incorporated fabrics and impressions from his travels to Africa and the outback of Australia. E-horse quilts employ collage techniques to form representations of places and their histories. Ihor, would you like to say a few words about your piece? Okay, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm a bit humbled sometimes uh, to be included in a show such as this. This is my first one. Um, this is actually my second art quilt. Uh, I quite enjoy it. Uh, you mentioned woodworking. To me, quilting is like woodworking without the slivers. That's what I like to say. So uh, the this, this quilt was a an inspiration of our, what we call a, a song line of our trip to Australia. And we tried to focus on the Aboriginal, uh, the different things, the Aboriginal culture and uh, the colors and uh, just the sheer expanse of that country because it is a big country. And I was determined when I was in Alice Springs is to go to this quilt shop that specialized in Aboriginal designed quilts. And I ended up buying $500 worth of quilts that uh, material that I had to carry for the next four weeks with me. But uh, the lady, when I left the shop said, uh, I can close the doors now because I've made my quota for the day. Anyway, the quilt uh, represents kind of our journey. Uh, there was a couple of design elements I wanted to capture. The first one being is I wanted the quilt to to look like it was Aboriginal in its uh, design and style. And the second thing I looked for was to try and flow the colors through the overall quilt, blending it from one color into another color. And the dark border sort of contrasts everything. And if you look carefully at the quilt, those familiar with Australia, you can see that it really is a map of the eastern half of Australia with Uluru in the, uh, in the center. Now, Uluru is very, very sacred to the Aboriginal people. They are now the traditional owners of, uh, of the land there, and uh, they have taken, uh, uh, taken it back from, I guess, what can I say, the early settlers. And uh, things like climbing Uluru, which was a common uh, pastime, is no longer allowed. So it, it is a very sacred place and you can see things like teaching caves uh, where the original Aboriginal uh, designs are, have been drawn on the rocks and all that. Uh, we spent a lot of time on what Australians refer to as the outback and it's quite a desolate piece of landscape and uh, it was a rough journey. Um, Anyway, I don't, I don't know what more to say. It's, uh, I try to have fun with this quilt. I tried not to take it too seriously when I was pu putting it together. And uh, it is a, it's kind of a family heirloom for us now. Anyway, I think I'll uh, leave it at that. Uh, I can highlight on some of the things. Uh, uh, the snake, uh, the, the serpent at the, the bottom right, the bottom center represents the Outback Trail. Uh, going down into Melbourne, the city of Melbourne and wine country. Up in the top corner within the square, the top left corner are the, uh, what is referred to as the Seven Sisters, which is a, a star cluster in the Southern Hemisphere, which again is quite, uh, quite important to uh, the culture of the uh, indigenous people of Australia. Anyway, I had fun making the quilt. Uh, it's nice to see it in a show. It's uh, I've got a couple more in, in the back of my mind that I hope to pursue someday. Thank you. Thank you. It, it, it is terrific. And it's large and definitely a statement piece. Our next artist is K Caitlin Horvath. She is from Bournemouth, Dorset in the United Kingdom. She taught biology and chemistry to public school students while carrying on a craft practice. 
taught as a child in Hungary to crochet, knit, embroider, and weave by her grandmother, it was not until 20 years ago she discovered patchwork. Her enthusiasm for nature and its symmetry, shapes, colors, and healing powers inspire her textile work. So welcome, Caitlin. Thank you very much. Greetings to everyone. First of all, I would like to thank you, Luana and Leslie, and everyone who worked very hard to organize this powerful exhibition. I am very honored to be here with you today. As a biology and chemistry teacher, I always placed special emphasis on the environmental education of my students. And I wanted to raise awareness of the environmental problems and especially the correspondence between our actions and the consequences. When my quilt was created in uh, 2014, scientists already have been raising and waving the red flags to warn us of the rapid changing of our environment. Now, this warning is even more severe with this pandemic telling us that we need to change. The idea of this quilt came from a dream when I saw this beautiful woman, this beautiful lady, whose locks of hair represented the different corners and regions of the world. I gave these locks of hair different colors to represent our uniqueness and diversity. And I applied different shades of these colors to the locks of hair as a background. And then I uh, selected different cultural and traditional and natural characteristics to each region and applied them onto the background. There is Japan and China on the right, and on top there is Middle East and South America, Australia, Africa, Europe, North America, Alaska, and India. And I emphasize the last scale a little more because of a personal experience. I spent two years in Alaska and the first year I was there, it was so warm mm -hmm. that the snow started to melt in the middle of the winter. Native people said it wasn't usual and it was not right. That year was 1992, almost. 30 years ago. The white lock of the hair is Hungary, where I come from. I applied a beautiful traditional embroidery design to it from Kalocha. The red um, lock on the top is Tibet. I applied the powerful mantra of Avalokiteshvara the Bodhisattva of compassion. And it says, Om Mani Peme Hung. And the face, the face is white because it represents the ice cap on the face of our earth. The ice cap that is fading away. And I just hope this face will not disappear and our children can see her smiling too and call her Mother Earth their home too. Thank you. It is fabulous and I can't wait. One of the things that is so amazing about everyone's art and their pieces are the wonderful messages, the beautiful imagery, and there's always something different that you can see in every person's, you, you just keep going back and looking again and you see something new. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our next artist is Kathy Nida. Kathy is a middle school science teacher in El Cajon, California. She is also a printmaker, a quilt artist, and an embroiderer. Her current work originates in dreams, a range of memories, and images of women. Kathy translates these sources into narrative artworks combining fabric, beads, embroidery, paint, and ink. Hello, Kathy. 
Hi. Um, so this is You Pollute Me. Um, I am a middle school science teacher, uh, so I have similar responses in trying to explain to my students how to be responsible. Um, and we had just finished teaching climate change. Um, and I, a lot of my quilts, I can't necessarily show to my students and I wanted to make something that I could. So there's no nudity in this one. Um, but I wanted to look at some of the things, you know, my students are like, well, we're already doing this. We have windmills because we have a lot of those out here in Southern California and we're recycling and we're doing this. And I'm like, it's not enough. Um, and so some of the images that are in the quilt are positive things that we've done, um, like, you know, the windmills, the recycling, um, and things like that. But interspersed with all these, you know, happy animals and beautiful landscapes, there's all these negative things that we've done. Um, and even weather is in there because, you know, a lot of the things that we're doing have just an effect on the weather around us. Um, so you have your factories, you have your your dams, which I think one of the previous artists talked about, you know, it's blocking salmon's access to their, where they need to be. Well, it's also blocking, you know, uh, ecosystems that are below where those uh, dams are, um, not to mention oil wells and factories and all that. And, and everybody always asks about the rocket ship and the alien uh, UFO up at the top. And I'm like, one of the things uh, we actually taught this year was asking our kids, um, you have a choice, like we can all move to Mars and we can start over. And so what does that look like? Or we can stay here and fix what we have. So which do you think is the harder thing to do? And so that's a conversation I have with my 12 year old students. Um, and then I, I, I'm like, and the alien, the aliens coming here because they've already destroyed their planet. So it's just kind of a, a way to have a conversation about, um, we are doing our little tiny things, but we need to make decisions about bigger things. Like, you know, I, I talk to my mom sometimes and she's like, you can't take my car. I'm like, I don't wanna take your car. I just want the world to still be there when my great, great grandchildren are here. So that's kind of what this quilt came out of. Well, it is fun and educational and poignant all at the same time. So thank you, Kathy. Our next artist is MJ Kinman. After 25 years in business in the nonprofit sector, in 2014, MJ began a full-time creative career. Noted for developing techniques to create large-scale painted and quilted renderings of gemstones, MJ's award-winning art has been exhibited in galleries, museums, and national jury competitions. It resides in private as well as corporate collections. Hello, MJ. Hi, it's good to be here. Thanks so much for uh, hosting us, Leslie and Luana, for inviting us. It's a real honor to be here uh, today, among all these other great artists. Um, you know, when I was a little girl, I was showing signs of real uh, geekiness, real nerdiness. Um, I love to do little research papers. And one of my very first little research papers that I did, I pulled the World Book Encyclopedia down out of our little uh, bookshelf and wrote a paper on pollution. And because it, it concerned me then as a little girl, what was happening to our planet? And that was a long, long time ago. And it still concerns me. Um, it concerns all of us. And so I was really honored when Luana invited me to be a part of this, to try to express my concern of what's happening um, as we're quickly running out of time. That's what Eclipse 2020 is, uh, is about. It's a, a, re a representation of our beautiful blue-green home, um, our aquamarine of a planet, our beautiful paraeba tourmaline uh, called uh, Mother Earth, and how it's being quickly eclipsed by the looming disaster that's, that's, that's chasing us, that, that's, that's happening right now. We're not completely darkened, but we, we are close. We can still get away, but we need to change. We need to come together. I think, I think there are glimmers of hope. I see things changing just in the last few weeks as we're coming together to say, this isn't right, this isn't right. We need to do something about this. It's as though we're getting past our us, them, our we, they, to we're all one. That's what I think it's gonna take for us to do that. Um, this quilt is um, my, my hope for that. This is a quilt that's done with um, a technique called 
freezer paper piecing technique. It's traditional piecing um, with freezer paper as your template. It's not foundation paper piecing. It's, a, it's a, something that I've been doing for 20 years as I've been putting together my giant gem quilts. So thank you for letting me be a part of this and um, I wish you all the best and hopefully we'll be able to get together soon. And I like that idea of toasting a little champagne all together one day. Love it. Thank you so much. Our next artist could not be with us. Um, it is Shizuku Koroha, who is from Japan. She did live in the United States for two years in the late 70s. There, she saw an antique quilt and immediately purchased the materials to make a quilt of her own. Kuroha-san is known for combining traditional Japanese indigo and sarahas fabrics and manipulating the log cabin block and mosaic patterns to create round shapes. She has operated a quilt school in Japan for more than 40 years and has students from around the world and has also published many books. On behalf of Kuroha san, Luana is going to talk a little bit about this quilt entitled Wish for the Beautiful Earth. Thank you. So this quilt was in uh, Kuroha san's exhibit in Houston this last fall. Some of you may have seen it. And I also saw her in Japan in Tokyo in January and was able to speak to her a little bit about the fact that we had this project together, which was lovely. When I first saw this piece, it just struck me. Um, I, I hadn't even read the title of it, and I thought, wow, what is this? And I came closer. It's made up of, uh, from what I could tell, these recycled indigo fabrics that you see in so many of the Japanese traditional quilts that are made uh, by contemporary quilt makers with that very Japanese design aesthetic. So I think it says very simply and very beautifully what we all hope for Mother Earth, which is let's return to this simple, clean, beautiful lifestyle on our planet. And I, I, this is one of those that I hope you can just see in person because um, it, it has quite a, a powerful impact when you're standing in front of it. Anything else you'd like to say, Leslie? Um, no. A great job. It, it was in Houston for anyone who ha who was in Houston last year and had the ability to see it. Um, yes, it really does look. It looks like the earth and the sky and the oceans, and um, it is it is really beautiful. So and it's very uh, Japanese. <laughs> very Japanese. And yes, for that we are grateful. Um, but yes, it is a beautiful piece, and, and I'm so glad that you saw it and thought to include it because it really is a great addition to the exhibition. Um, from there, we are going to introduce you to Sheila Frampton Cooper. From Los Angeles, Sheila has done creative work in painting, jewelry making, and architectural photography before she began working with quilts. Sheila often draws creative energy in working without patterns or sketches. Her, insp her inspiration flows from the natural environment, particularly the ocean, and her own imagination. Sheila leads workshops internationally on techniques used in her provisionally pieced artwork, and she is exhibited all over the world, including the United States, France, Italy, England, China, and Japan. So welcome, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you, Larry and Luana. And I'm really enjoying seeing all of these beautiful artworks. And it's really an honor to be a part of this group with everybody's different expression of this really important time in our history. And this particular piece, for me, I love tropical fish. It's no secret if anybody's ever heard me talk about my work. Biggest upsetting thing to me with that could be so easily, well, not easily fixed, but people really need to wake up fast is the plastic. The mm -hmm. plastic in the oceans, just the beaches, the litter, the, it's just our planet is a blue planet. And every night before I go to sleep, 
I watch shows about the universe and our planet is so unique. They keep searching, looking for water on this moon or that moon. And we have something so special. So I feel ultimately, well, let me back up and talk a little bit about this piece and why I titled it as such. With the global warming, with the plastic, the reefs, everything, species just disappearing all the time. This was my little way of saying, I get emotional, I'm just, oh, God, what the heck? Anyway, yeah, it's just that, that last little sweet fish just looking around, you know, and that's, I'm shocked that I'm getting emotional talking about it, but I feel it's with the children because there's so many adults and people that, you know, they're closed. They're just closed. So with children, if we can get it into the schools, into everything, broaden their horizons to really understand this planet and how absolutely unique and special it is. Because when people come set away, it's a lot more different. Everybody can sit and say, we need to do this and that. It's like, well, you really can only do it yourself. And I feel our best hope is with the children and that they just come up with a different way of looking at the world with respect and with plastic and with everything. So thank you so much. Sorry I got emotional, <laughs> but yeah. No, because it's true, right? Yeah, it also, it, this is a piece that, um, it's a whole cloth painting, painted with fiber reactive dye, uh, and it's free motion embroidered around. But, uh, yeah, that's it. But the message is the important part. Yes, well, it's so sweet. He's a sweet little fish, and we don't want yeah. it to be the last. No, we don't. <laughs> right? Which is... Wonderful that you talk about this whole effort, right? And this idea that we need to get into the schools and talk to the kids and begin to change that mindset and philosophy, um, which is why we have wonderful artists who are currently educators or have been educators and, and are beginning to get that message across, especially through a wonderful vehicle like arts and a wonderful vehicle like quilts that are something that so many people can understand and relate to. Um, that message is so much more easily conveyed. So it's true. And I, I guess I would consider myself a quiet activist because most of my work is inspired and it's about the ocean and plant life and all that, pretty much everything. So yeah, I think I have more than hope. I have a knowing that uh, things are really changing now in yeah. every way, on every level. So, yeah, but thank you. So from your sweet fish, we are going to go and visit with Susan Boo Baker Knapp um, about her quilt, Bald Head, Bald Head Island Marsh After the Storm. Susan is a fiber artist and designer, author and teacher living in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Susan begins with photographs and working with fabric, thread, and the techniques of whole cloth painting, along with fused applique to create works in a realistic style. Um, welcome, Susan. Thank you. Um, I was thinking about the fact that I think environmentalism really starts with love of a place. You know, as a child, I think if you can fall in love with a place, whether it's the ocean or the mountains or the land, mm -hmm. um, you start to realize how precious it is. And then you start to care about how it's treated. And that was really the case for my children with Bald Head Island. Um, Bald Head Island is one of the barrier islands off the coast of North Carolina, where I've lived for almost 25 years now. 
and our family has gone on vacation to this island for about 17 years, I think. So from the time my children were babies, we were going. And you have to take a ferry from the mainland of North Carolina to get there. The barrier islands are a really special ecosystem. Um, very diverse, very uh, interesting. And most of the barrier islands have a beach side, which is where most people go. And then they also have a sound side um, that has um, a salt marsh. And that marsh is critically important, whether it's the marsh on these barrier islands or marshland on the coast of, you know, off of our oceans. Like if you think about New Jersey, for example, with all that marsh. Um, they act as filtration. They act as a nursery for lots of species. They filter all sorts of bad things out of the water. Um, and they're just so important. And when I made this piece, it was right after Hurricane Florence hit the coast, which was in 2018. It dumped about 36 inches of rain on North Carolina. And it was catastrophic, not only for the people, of that area. I mean, there were a lot of deaths, a lot of people who were just totally wiped out, but it also um, exacerbated existing problems that we have in North Carolina with, we have coal ash um, beds where they've, you know, from making energy out of coal, they've buried the ash underground and with all that water, it started leaking into the rivers and into our water system. We also have a huge um, pork industry in North Carolina and a lot of the waste, both the urine and feces from hogs is stored in these big, you know, lakes basically on farms. Guess what happens when you get 36 inches of rain? That too goes into the water system. It all drains through the creeks and the rivers and then out into Cape Fear and Cape Fear comes out right at Bald Head Island. So it was influenced by all of that the water was so high on Bald Head that the alligators were swimming down the little roads. Um, it was about six feet deep in those roads. So, um, you know, I, I found, after the hurricane, I went online and was looking for photos of what the island looked like with all this rain and found this photo by Steve Montgomery. Um, he had been flying in a helicopter and was able to take this photo. So I contacted him and got permission to use his photo. But when I looked at it, it just seemed like arteries and capillaries. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize how much the salt marsh is the heart of the island. Um, mm -hmm it's, you know, it's recovered pretty well, but the ecological damage that, that we are doing and climate change are making all of the hurricanes much, much worse. And it's going to influence the people and the land in ways that I think we have only started to really understand. So thanks again to both Leslie and Luana. I was honored to be in this exhibit. Well, we are so pleased to have you and it is a beautiful piece. Our next artist is Sue Devaney. She is a multimedia artist from Melbourne, Victoria in Australia. She has worked in landscape and portraiture painting, fine photography and fashion. She currently combines painting and design training with self-taught techniques to create elaborate stitched textile art. Her award-winning art has been exhibited in Australia, United Kingdom, United States and Dubai. Welcome, Sue. Good morning. Oh, good evening for you guys. Good morning for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you, Luana, for inviting me to be part of this exhibit. Thank you, Leslie, for all this hard work. I really love the virtual tour too. You know, that was wonderful. And the, the works of art, I'm glad to be last of this because to the, the amazing works of art in this exhibit is phenomenal. So uh, I'm just honoured, humbled, honoured to be part of it. So first of all, this, uh, this piece, I was fortunate enough to um, go and see the mountain gorillas in um, Rwanda. And uh, after a three hour hike to get there, um, sorry about my dog barking too, you can hear it. Um, so I was honoured to get there, but we had, you're, you're allowed an hour with these, uh, a family of mountain gorillas. And there was four of us in the group and plus our, our guides. And even though it was a small family, this particular 
um, I guess the, the silverback being the male and the head of the family, uh, this was the matriarch, I guess, in, because she was the eldest female and she was 40 years old and she was seven months pregnant. Mm -hmm. And it was just amazing to see mature age pregnancy in, in the animal kingdom. And I thought, well, this is the future. They, they, they work very hard there to, to look after these mountain gorillas because these are the only gorillas that can't be kept in captivity. Um, you, you do have silverbacks in zoos and so on, but the mountain gorillas haven't survived in captivity. So these, these guys are really important to uh, the, the future. And it, it, she just, it was just amazing to see these families, to see the toddlers and, and showing off and, and you know, it, it was just phenomenal. So it was a great experience for me. And, you know, with all this COVID virus going on and everything, you know, the animals are doing better. Um, to me, it's, it's Mother Earth saying, you know, to the humans, just stop what you're doing. Have a look, have a look around you. You know, we can all make a difference if we just stop. Yes. Well, it is a beautiful piece. I love her eyes. They are just <laughs> mesmerizing. They are. Yeah. Uh, oh, good. We thought it would was really powerful to walk into the gallery and see her and the Madonna looking at one another, right? Yes. Uh, yes. So yeah, it um, it is really wonderful. So. Thank you. I just, it is, it is a lovely, lovely piece. Thank um, you. We are getting close to our time and we are definitely last but not least would be Luana's um, quilt, Rocky Mountain Poison. So I'm going to just turn it over to Luana and she can finish this out. Okay. This piece was made for the Water is Life, sorry, Water is Life exhibit which premiered at the United Nations. And actually Hollis was a part of that exhibit also. Uh, it was curated by Susan Fiorentino and Alison Wilbur. And then it traveled to a show with the uh, US Embassy in Rome and then came to Houston and then traveled through Mancuso shows and was seen by over 100,000 people. But when it first opened at the United Nations, the cultural attache came to me and said, you have to make more quilts like this. And you, if you look on the right-hand side here, you may be able to see that there are words stitched into the water with the skulls. This is about the Gold King mine spill in the Animas River in Durango, Colorado. And the information about what was in the water and how it might affect those downstream was not all coming out to the public. I had friends who lived there who were testing the water and finding more in the water than was coming out in the press. So they asked me if I would tell the story in this quilt, which is what I did. And um, I'll, I'll keep it a little bit short here, Leslie, since we're coming to the end of our time. But uh, my purpose with this quilt is to really encourage others to tell stories and move people and give other people permission to speak out. I decided that I wanted to donate this quilt to Earthworks. And after I had made that commitment, we were planning to have an auction. Uh, Leslie approached me about acquiring the quilt for the museum. So we kind of did some horse trading uh, and we decided that we would have a GoFundMe to raise money to purchase the quilt for Earthworks. And then Earthworks would donate the quilt to IQM, which is what happened. So now the quilt is going to live at the museum and I am delighted beyond words. Thank you, Leslie. And it was some of those early conversations that were the spark, the idea of this exhibit. So Leslie and I have been nurturing this little baby along for a couple years here. And this quilt represents, you know, the beginning of that, perhaps the seed of that. So I just want to thank all of you from the bottom of my heart. I, I feel very emotional too. It's a very emotional topic for me and I know for all of you what is happening on the planet. And I really believe that together with our voices combined, we can make a difference. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Luana. I do not, I'm looking and I do not see any questions in the chat. 
um, function. So I'm going to give people just a few minutes if they have something that they want to type in or to ask, or if there are any questions that any of you have for one another. Um, I think we should take a few minutes and ask those, or if you have some comments that you would like to make. Um, I, of course, made mine in a running dialogue throughout the whole program, so thank you for um, giving me that. Um, is there anything that anyone would like to add? Oh, I see that MJ has a question. I have to take off my glasses, sorry. MJ has a question for Susan. I'm interested about the yellow background of her beautiful mountain gorilla quilt. Is this leaf pattern printed on the fabric or is it a result of free motion machine quilting? Ah, yeah, it's free motion machine quilting. Um, the only, uh, what I wanted to, I didn't say enough about the quilt was the fact that I wanted um, this uh, mountain gorilla to be actually coming out of the leaves. And I, it was very hard being such a contrast of the blue fabric to the yellow. That um, so I free motion some of the leaves over um, when I quilted it over the the collage of the gorilla, and then to blend it I rolled over with um, a similar yellow paint with a brayer over the the quilting mm. just to sort of blend it a little bit. But yeah, it's all free motion quilting. That's I'll, it's another passion of mine. <laughs> Gorgeous. Thank you. Okay. What other comments or questions do we have? Anyone? Do any of our listeners have anything that they want to add? All right. Laura Chapman, do you have anything that you see? I don't see any questions here. Um, oh, it does look like we have an observation from June Peterson that just came in. And Excellent. Says, this is a critical exhibit that is a cautionary tale for our planet. I'm so privileged to have been part of this afternoon. Thank you so much. And I'll just mention to anyone who's watching now or in the recording later, because this will be available for viewing later, that the online exhibition is up and the quilts are on there in high resolution. And so if you'd like to go in and really look at some of that fabric or some of those stitches a little bit more closely, you can do that now on our website at internationalquiltmuseum.org. It is the first slide. Mm -hmm. Um, Hollis, do you have a question or something that you would like to say? Oh, you're on mute. You're Laura, on mute. Or Laura, can you unmute Hollis? Okay, I can. Okay, Allison Wilbur has asked a question. Sure. Has your quilts raised any difficult conversations with viewers? So the exhibit, great question. The exhibition has just gone up virtually and will be open August 4th um, for the public to see. So, so far, no, there hasn't been. Um, and I think that one of the, you know, the quilts are beautiful in their right. When you read Luana's curatorial statement about the fact that all of you are a group of artists who have concerns about the environment, and are expressing your concerns and love for Mother Earth through your art and your artistic talents. Um, I think it will begin to get people thinking. And I suspect that once we begin tours and begin having people in the museum, we will begin to hear and have those dialogues, um, which we can't wait. We love, we love to have that conversation and to have that impetus. Um, there is a comment from, a, viewer who says, I am just in awe of your work, all of you. Thank you for making this available. Um, somebody else mentioned that they don't have any questions, but wanted to comment that this is fabulous. And thank you to all of the artists and to the museum. So that's wonderful. And um, Betty, you have a comment? Oh, um, are, are you going to send us a link we can share for the show? Is it uh, for the virtual show? Is it going to be open to the public? Yes. Um, Laura, do you want to comment on that? 
Uh, the video that you saw earlier of the virtual tour that is on the main page for the website, but it is also up on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. And you're welcome to share any of those. They're all public, um, whichever is easiest for you. I, um, the website address for the exhibition itself is internationalquiltmuseum.org slash exhibition slash love hyphen Gaia, or you can go to our um, homepage and click on the slide there, which might be a little bit easier, but um, the recording of this will also be available on that exhibition page and um, <laughs> for, for uh, <laughs> Great, thanks. <laughs> And there was a follow-up question to the previous one. Um, it was it was um, in regards to asking about if your if your um, quilts have raised difficult conversations with viewers. The question was from the artists. Have any of the artists have um, that kind of experience with their works? Maybe we could all answer that. <laughs> um, Hollis, do you want to start? Uh, well, I have been making quilts about social issues and environmental issues for the last 25 years. And I think that, um, I think our, our country goes through ebbs and flows. I think that there are times when people are really open to it and they really want to talk about it. And mm -hmm. then that passes and they don't want to talk about it at all. And and I think it just really kind of depends upon, um, quite frankly, what's going on in the government and, you know, what they're hearing on the news every day. And, and um, I think that there are always people who are interested in supporting it and supporting art for um, acting as visual activism. But then I think that there are other people who they just don't want to hear about it at all, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And I think the wonderful thing about using art to start these discussions is um, sometimes the people don't really realize that that's what the art's all about. And then when they come close and they start to look at it and they start to understand and then read the artist statement, often when they're doing that, they're alone. And they're touched with it in a different way. And that's why I think it's so powerful for us to do art that is a statement about the environment because people often think it's pretty pictures until they actually take the time to look at it. And it's a really wonderful way to start discussions. And that's one of the reasons that I can't get it out of my system. I have to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Such a good way to bring across the point. Mm -hmm. Luana? Yeah, I just wanted to say that we we have this thing going on where topics are politicized to get people to stop talking about them. But I believe that when an issue is an ethical or moral issue or about survival, we have a responsibility to step past that and to say, no, this is not a political issue. This is an ethical or moral or survival issue. And that's how you give people permission to talk about these things. Good point. Um, Cass, did you wanna add something? Um, everything that I've worked with and everything that I do with my own work is with found and recycled materials. I don't buy a single thing. I retrieve, I reclaim. Um, I even take paints out of a bin to use. And I think we have got so used to just buying what we want. The first thing people wanted to do here when they came out of lockdown was to go shopping. Um, what we do as artists is just reflect back to the world, the world we see. And it, it's not always pretty and it's not always comfortable but it needs to, to be reflected back. I'm very grateful for Luana for inviting me to exhibit. She saw my work in Japan early in the year. This piece hasn't been seen before. This is the first time it's been exhibited. Um, so it's not making those big statements about the planet. It's just making a small statement about where I live and the small changes I can make. And I think people feel they can't make a difference because I'm only one person. 
one person can become many voices and many voices can make a change. And if we don't start individually, we can't begin to make pressure onto our governments and our leaders. And you taught in our classroom too. I did, didn't I, Luana? Yeah, I know, it seems like so long ago now. <laughs> Feels like another world ago. Um, um, yes, I oh. think this is our wake up call. Um, mm -hmm. And I worked in community arts, so it's always for me being about local, local as part of global. They reflect backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see this happen uh, over and over again with many different issues. Um, I think as artists, we have a voice and we can use that. Uh, not only our voice but our our art to create the conversation um you know oftentimes people who know me know that um i have a mouth <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, they, they, they hear that i make quilts and um, they have a preconception of what a quilt maker might or should be and then they hear my views on things and um i, I think we do have a very powerful channel a very powerful way to get our uh, ideas across and uh as you continue to do this, Luana and Leslie, um, I'm, I'm in. Let's, let's keep doing this on a host of variety of issues because there are a variety of issues that we're dealing with right now, um, particularly the environment, particularly um, you know, the, the race relations. Um, I want to be a part of this. And so thank you for the opportunity. Well, we're glad to have you. And yes, there, we, there are many issues for which we can move forward on. Anybody else want to make a last comment before we wrap up and say goodbye? I'm looking at all of your faces at, at, at this expanded Hollywood Squares <laughs> that I have on screen with me. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you. Um, I want to thank Luana um, not only for being a great guest curator, um, I want to thank her for her generosity for Dr. Don as a sponsor of this exhibition um, and have been dear good friends of the museums as well over the years too. So um, all of you, it is lovely to see your faces. Um, it is wonderful to see you. Please stay well, stay healthy, and um, hopefully we will see you in Lincoln in your own exhibition in the gallery. So be well to everyone. Um, love to you all, yes. and. Um, love and health across the globe. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Love you. Bye-bye.